um, we will try to adjust if there are any technical difficulties. Um, but we want to, again, thank you. We realized that this uh, was sent out with short notice, but the House ACA repeal bill is moving very quickly and it's passed out of multiple committees and a floor vote is expected for next week. So we wanted to make sure everybody had the information they needed. Um, and I do just want to note at the beginning that this webinar will focus solely on those provisions of the bill that impact Medicaid. And we encourage um, everyone, if you're interested in the other provisions that affect the, the ACA as a whole, we encourage you to look at um, organizations such as the Kaiser Family Foundation and the National Health Law Program um, for more ACA specific info. Um, we will be focusing solely on Medicaid. Um, I also want to note that we're going to have a question and answer at the end. And so please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box as we go along and we will get those uh, get to those at the end of our webinar. And just for quick introductions, my name is Marianne Davies and I'm a staff attorney at the Disability Law Center. And I will be joined later in the webinar by my colleague Nate Krippus, who's also a staff attorney here at the Disability Law Center. So just a little background about the Disability Law Center. We are a private nonprofit organization and we're designated by the governor as Utah's protection advocacy agency. Every state in, um, in the nation has an agency like ours and we, many of our clients, if not all, utilize Medicaid in some way and we do work a lot on Medicaid issues and um, that includes Medicaid appeals. Um, our mission is to enforce and strengthen the laws that protect the opportunities, choices, and legal rights of Utahns with disabilities. And our work includes areas such as accessibility, assistive technology, civil rights, education, housing, transportation. Um, we are a law center and our services are at no cost to clients. So if you or someone you know is experiencing an issue in one of these areas related to your disability, um, please contact us and we will have some contact information at the end of our webinar. So just a little bit of background on Medicaid. Medicaid is over 50 years old and has operated as a federal state partnership to provide health insurance to people with low incomes. And children, people with disabilities, and older adults account for a majority of Medicaid expenditures. And Medicaid does serve people across a lifespan. So this includes services such as early intervention all the way to long-term care. And Medicaid is the primary source or the biggest payer of long-term care in America. Um, and I mention that because for a large part, private insurance doesn't cover a lot of long-term care. Long-term care includes services such as nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, and home and community-based services. Um, home and community-based services include things such as group homes, um, sheltered workshops, day programs, personal care services. These are all services that help people to remain at home and in their communities. Um, and I mention this because with the proposed changes to Medicaid, there's really a concern that, you know, over the last 30 years, we've made a lot of progress towards helping people to remain at home and in their communities. And with um, some of the proposed changes, there is a concern in the disability community that this could reverse that progress and have more people um, seek coverage in institutions um, rather than at home and in their communities. Um, I also want to mention whether or not you're on Medicaid, you probably know someone on Medicaid. Um, these services are very far reaching and they touch all of us and everyone we know. So just some background about Utah's Medicaid program. Um, since its inception, Medicaid has functioned as a matching program for the actual cost of care. So for every dollar Utah spends, we get about $2.50 in matching funds from the federal government um, with no caps. So, um, you know, we can serve people if there's, um, you know, a, some sort of epidemic or unexpected health care costs, we can serve people and expect to get those federal matching dollars that we need to help Utahns in our state. 
Um, and Medicaid accounts for about 45% of federal dollars received by the state, which is a very large chunk of money that we, we get from the federal government into our state budget. Um, and in Utah, Medicaid serves many Utahns with disabilities, kids and older adults. Um, you can see here that you know, one in three low-income adults are served by Medicaid, one in five children, one in two nursing home residents, and one in three people with disabilities. So how does the American Health Care Act impact Medicaid? And the American Health Care Act is the, the name of the House ACA repeal bill. Um, well, the bill dramatically changes Medicaid um, because it changes it from a federal matching program and converts it into a, what is called a per capita cap. Um, and that what that means is that we will have a cap on the amount of federal dollars that we can receive from the federal government. And this will be based on Utah's 2016 expenditures and not the actual costs of the program. Um, the cap will then increase at a rate that is projected to be less than Medicaid spending. Um, so what that means is that the federal, as, as, increase, as costs increase, the federal amount that we get will be smaller and the more amount of money the state has to spend will be bigger. Um, and using 2016 as a measure um, can be problematic going forward because Utah is a state that has a steadily increasing older population that will be utilizing Medicaid. And I mention that because um, uh, older adults, their care is, is more costly. It's five times higher than kids and other adults. Um, so this increase will not really be tied to the realities of our population and Medicaid expenditures. And so as a result, our state will have less federal funds and more responsibility will be shifted to the state. It's projected that $370 billion will be shifted to the states in Medicaid responsibility over the next 10 years. And this will likely lead to cuts in coverage and services. Um, so now for a little bit more specific information about those cuts in services and the programs at issue, I'm just going to turn it over to my colleague, Nate. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I think one of the, the big things uh, we're seeing a lot in, in media coverage and what, what you're hearing out there is um, related to uh, expansion and uh, Utah is not a, a Medicaid expansion state, so I think a lot of people are are of the belief that um, Utah is not going to be impacted by by this legislation. Um, but but this state, Utah will still be impacted, as as my colleague mentioned. Um, it's going to shift a lot of costs to the state. Um, the the nonpartisan uh, Congressional Budget Office just uh, released a report saying that uh, they anticipate uh, 880 billion dollars. Uh, will be cut from uh, the Medicaid program over the next 10 years. Um, and what that means is that uh, 24 million or an estimated 24 million people will lose uh, their health insurance coverage uh, and 14 million of those uh, losing coverage will come from the Medicaid program. Um, and while this bill does uh, take a lot of funding from Medicaid, it actually doesn't change the, the legal requirements that, that Medicaid has. So uh, Medicaid has uh, a variety of services that are mandatory um, under federal law um, and some that are uh, optional. And I'll go into a little more specific on that in just a minute. Um, but it also doesn't really, uh, outside of expansion and a few other minor uh, details, it doesn't really deal with eligibility. Um, so um, a lot of people will still be eligible for Medicaid um, and uh, the, the services they need will still be either required or, or optional. Um, so some examples uh, of uh, mandatory services uh, there on the screen. Uh, um, as my colleague mentioned, uh, long-term care is a, a big component for older Americans.
Let's um, connect my audio. That's it. Can uh, I know we lost some folks there. Can everyone hear me now? Okay, great, great. Okay, um, I'm not exactly sure where I, I lost sound, so I will uh, back up a little bit, and I apologize if I'm repeating myself. Um, so I was going into a little bit about uh, mandatory services um, and, and uh, you know, nursing facilities, what would still be uh, mandatory services, and that's, you know, what, what we would expect is the optional services. When the state sees that widening gap, uh, in, in funding grow uh, between what the, the federal government is providing and what the needs of Medicaid recipients are, um, we anticipate the state would, would look to optional services um, to cut. Uh, and what that means um, is, you know, things like home and community-based services, uh, some mental health care and, and prescription coverage, ABA therapy, some of those things could, could face uh, deep cuts. And what that would look like, um, and, and I'll use an example of, of DSPD services, um, what we anticipate is while the services that currently exist may not be uh, lost, what we may see is um, waiting lists grow considerably, wait times grow considerably, um, and people just not having that access to the, the home and community services that, that they, they need. Um, you know, mental health care is, is a big uh, optional service here in the state, and, and we could see a lot of cuts to that. Um, prescription coverage, uh, a good example that how that could impact folks is... Uh, um, individuals with HIV, uh, you know, some of those, those prescription medications are, are very expensive uh, and people require them to, to live. And even gaps in, in taking that medication can, can lead to bad results. Um, so, you know, a, a cut to prescription coverage would, ha would have uh, deep impacts to a lot of folks. Um, some other services that, that Medicaid provides are in schools, um, like speech therapy, OT, PT, um, occupational therapy and physical therapy, sorry, uh, that uh, may be um, important for a lot of children. And, you know, with these deep cuts to Medicaid, we, we expect these services could see some, uh, some deep cuts. So there's a lot in, out there now about how this uh, Medicaid uh, or how this bill will uh, allow Medicaid and states to have a lot of flexibility. Um, States currently have a great deal of flexibility in how they uh, design their Medicaid programs. There are Medicaid waivers and demonstrations um, that allow states to, to do a lot of different things, to provide a lot of different services and a lot of different care to, to people. Um, and that flexibility currently exists. Uh, this bill doesn't really add any flexibility, considering that it, it, it takes funding away from the states and their ability to do things. Um, a, lot of, a lot of savings that states can generate require upfront spending. Um, and without that, that funding from the federal government, uh, we would likely see states being unable to make that upfront spending that would enable them to have the savings later on. Um, and I think my colleague mentioned uh, one of the big things is, uh, you know, Medicaid allows flexibility to respond to public health emergencies, like something like an opioid epidemic or, or the Zika virus. Um, and without that funding coming, coming in uh, and then coming in as a per capita cap, there just isn't the same flexibility for states to have the funding they need. Um, and one thing that uh, Utah has done is we haven't expanded Medicaid, uh, and so we've been fairly fiscally responsible. Um, and so because the spending uh, is, or the, the, the funding will be tied to the 2016 spending, what we, or what you'd see is Utah essentially being punished because our, our 2016 spending was, was fiscally responsible, but now we're getting exactly that for the foreseeable future after 2020. Um, so our, our amount we get will grow and the gap we have will grow over time. Uh, so what we uh, would urge folks to do is um, call your congressional representatives in the House and Senate and let them know a few things. Uh, first, they, they want to know that you're a constituent, um, you know, a little bit about how this will impact you if you're a person with disability or a family member. Um, you know, and tell them not to cut and cap Medicaid specifically. We hear that uh, the congressional delegation isn't hearing about uh, Medicaid specifically. They're hearing a lot about the Affordable Care Act repeal. They're hearing a lot about Medicaid expansion, um, but they're not hearing a lot about uh, the cuts to Medicaid. Um, one uh, interesting thing is one of my colleagues, actually Mary Ann, spoke with um, someone in Chris Stewart's staff, uh, and Chris Stewart has said he's, he's on the fence with this one. So, um, you know, when it comes to Medicaid cuts, we don't have 
um, necessarily a branch of government uh, that, that necessarily uh, will favor uh, preventing these cuts, but the people can can speak up, and that's what we're going to need. We need people to, to get out there and call the representatives and let them know uh, that, that you don't support this cut to Medicaid and what it could mean uh, if there are these drastic cuts to, to Medicaid. Um, and so uh, if, you know, we have some time for questions, but if you uh, need a little more information, you can always go to our website. Um, and we have set up an email address uh, at Medicaid at disabilitylawcenter.org um, where you can send us questions and we will respond to those certainly as quickly as we possibly can. Um, but now we have some time for questions. If anyone wants to start, I don't know if we have questions yet. Do we? No? We can give a minute. I should mention on our website, we, um, we do have a fact sheet and we do have a call to action with some talking points. Um, so we would encourage you to visit our website and, and get those resources and, and share them as far and wide as you can. Okay. That, well, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the questions here. Oh. Um, all right. Uh, first, I, somebody's asking if these slides will be available to share. I think uh, we, we, not yet. Uh, <laughs> we will get those out uh, sometime after this to, to everyone who attended. And and uh, if you know if you have if you want some of the fact sheets or any of the other information we have, feel free to. Um, uh, email us at Medicaid at disabilitylawcenter.org. And we will be, we are recording this presentation and we'll post it on our website as well. Um, and we can send out a link to everyone after afterwards um, so that you can access that when you need to. Okay. Um, um, yeah. It, Oh, yes, and, and the, the vote, sorry, yes, the vote uh, is uh, we're expecting to be early next week. Um, uh, and so we would, you know, call this week. If you're going to call your representatives, or, or please call your representatives, and, and if so, do so this week um, or as soon as possible. Um, this vote is is coming quick, and the House is really trying to push this through. So please do do reach out as soon as possible. Um, I, I do have, I want to mention, I see a comment here from, from someone named Chris, who said that he has spoken to Mia Love's office, and she is also uh, not decided. So... Um, you know, call your representatives. They they need to hear from people. So we, we do have a question here that says, as Medicaid services, especially long-term care and respite services go away, we could expect to see abuse and neglect cases increase. Do we have numbers on how this has changed over time with increased funding? Um, I do not have numbers readily available. Um, I I think what this raises an important point on is that as there's more responsibility on the state and more people trying to access services, um, especially in, in Medicaid facilities, um, you may see tighter budgets and, and typically um, private providers of you know, nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, other long-term care, um, where cost savings come in is typically staff. Um, and you'll see just really low staffing ratios. And that does certainly lead to an increase in abuse and neglect. So, you know, even though um, nursing facilities are mandatory care, we don't expect those to go away. Um, cuts in Medicaid will certainly impact those facilities. Um, uh, we also have a question from Eric uh, asking how soon, uh, if it passes, how soon it would be implemented. Um, you know, I think, first of all, some of the, some, some impacts would be felt uh, immediately, but uh, I know a lot of the, the big um, Medicaid cuts and everything would really go into effect, especially with expansion uh, after 2020. Um, but I mean, essentially, I mean, the, the bill would be implemented immediately. It would just, some of the, some of the, 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 um, timelines in there would would be uh, 
over time. So 2020, I think you'd really start to see uh, the, big, the biggest impacts hit around 2020. So we have another question. Utah has the highest rate of mental health illness in the nation. How do lawmakers propose to make up the difference in funding for these services at all? Um, you know, that is one thing we have not gotten an answer on, uh, which is why we're very concerned and why we're trying, trying to get people to be engaged and um, contact their representatives. Because I think, you know, as federal funds decrease, the more responsibility goes on to the state. And, um, you know, the, the state will really have to grapple with that is those issues. And we haven't heard from federal lawmakers what they plan to do to help make up for some of those gaps that would occur. Uh, we have another question here uh, asking whether it's better to call uh, rather than email our representatives. Uh, yes, yes, it is actually very important to call. Um, you know, lawmakers get a lot of emails. They, they get stuff from social media. They get, um, honestly, if, if calling isn't something, I would, I would actually say you can fax them. That seems to be a good uh, way to reach out. You know, they, they just get so much coming into them. So I think calling is, is the best thing you can do. If that's not something you, you feel comfortable with, I would I would recommend that you, you fax them if possible. Um, honestly, if, if you're not going to do anything, emailing them isn't something I would say you can't do. But 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 calling and faxing is certainly going to be the best way to get a response to get them to, to notice our responses. Um, the question: on, Should people be calling their school districts and asking them to get involved somehow? Um, so certainly. Um, Medicaid does pay for health-related services in schools. Um, so if you have school groups, um, parent groups, um, interested special ed directors, I think it's certainly, you know, it's great to reach out, let them know how this could impact um, services that are provided by Medicaid in schools and, and help people understand the, how the proposed changes will impact them and what they can do uh, to let their lawmaker know let their lawmakers know how concerned they are about these changes. And then we have another question. My son has a disability and is in a supported living residence or group home. Will that be cut at all? Um, so I think there is a, a very good uh, likelihood that could be affected. Um, a home and community-based services are optional services. And um, as the state's responsibility for Medicaid funding grows, but their legal requirements don't change, they're going to have to look for legal places they can cut services, which are in optional services, not in the mandatory. Home and community-based services are provided through a waiver. They're not mandatory. Um, and I think you it's very likely you could see services like group homes and other D DSPD funded, that's the Division of Services for People with Disabilities funded services, um, being cut and at the very least waiting lists growing at an exponential rate. Um, right now there's about 2,800 people on the waiting list and the waiting list is about six and a half years. Um, you could see that shoot up dramatically. Uh, so we have uh, another question. How does this affect homel homelessness and the shelter disagreement? Uh, Presumably, you're asking about the, the Salt Lake City uh, homeless shelter issue. Um, that's, I think that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the truth is that how it would affect homelessness is, um, you know, a lot of low-income folks rely on Medicaid services to, to get health care. Um, and so, you know, I don't know specifically what services the um, homeless shelters were, were going to provide. I know there was talk of some additional services beyond just, um, you know, giving people a place to stay. Um, I don't know, but but some of those presumably would be um, covered by Medicaid um, and certain things like mental health services, uh, prescription drugs and things like that would be um, optional. And we, we do anticipate there, there being cuts to that. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think that's a fair question. I think there could be some some issues with respect to homelessness and their shelters and what services 
would be available to those individuals with these cuts to Medicaid. Yeah, and um, I think those um, those shelters it was proposed that they would have um, services in the shelters themselves, um, and like Nate said, presumably those would be paid for um, in part by Medicaid. So that certainly could impact that model. Um, and I do just want to note, you know, I know we talked a little bit in the question before about DSPD services and, um, you know, the impact this could have. Um, I think it's, a, you know, I, I realize this sounds very dramatic and I, I, I do want to know everyone to know that nationally we are hearing these concerns as well. So these aren't just our concerns, but nationally people are saying that lives and independence of people with disabilities are really at stake. Um, you know, we've heard from many national organizations that they fear that this could essentially um, be a return to the days when people with disabilities were hidden away from our communities and, um, you know, warehoused in institutions. I think the disability community has made um, great strides. Um, this includes, you know, everybody receiving services, families, providers, everybody's worked really hard to make sure that people with disabilities can live full and independent lives, um, that they can work, that they can um, take care of themselves with supports um, through utilization of these important Medicaid services. And these are really um, in, in jeopardy right now. Another question on where you can get a list of mandatory services versus non-mandatory or optional services. Um, you know, there, there are resources um, from uh, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, you can go to Medicaid.gov. I know they have lists there. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, the state has some resources on, wait, is it the COBE? Yes, the, uh, then that can be found on the state legislature webpage. Um, and I would say if you email us at that Medicaid uh, email address, uh, we'd be happy to provide some links and other resources if, if that's a question we can, we can follow up on. Um, so we, we have a follow-up here, uh, someone, the earlier question about the, the, the woman with the son in a, in a supported living or group home, um, asking so we could lose funding for our son in the shared living residence. Uh, you know, I, I think that's what my colleague Marion was saying is, is I understand this seems um, like an overreaction, like we're saying all these, these horrible things could happen, but I, I think that what we're trying to say is this is very important. Um, yes, I, I think that's a possibility um, that, that your son could lose funding uh, if this bill is passed. Uh, I think additionally, um, other individuals who, who haven't yet gotten into those services, say on the waiting list, may see that time they're waiting to get into a, to a residence like that grow. Um, yeah, and I should also note that um, Voices for Utah Children just came out with a really great analysis on how um, if Utah had implemented per capita caps 10 years ago, what would the shortfall be? And the shortfall over 10 million or over 10 years would have been $650 million. Um, and Utah is a state that in our constitution, we have to balance our budget. It's not an option to carry deficits. And $650 million over 10 years is a huge amount. And that would all be coming out of our Medicaid budget. And I should know you can access that on their on their website. So um, they they've done a really great job, and we did encourage people to look at that analysis. Let's see. So we have a question: Do we contact the governor? If federal funds are paying for any of care for Salt Lake City shelters. Um, I think what's really important right now is to contact your representatives and senators and let them know that you were very concerned about um, the proposal to cut and cap Medicaid. Um, I think you can certainly also share those concerns with the governor, um, but representatives right now really need to hear about um, people's concerns about turning Medicaid into a per capita cap program. Um, and I, I can't emphasize what a huge change that is to the program. I mean, for 50 years, it's operated as a federal matching program, and changing it into per capita cap is just a, a huge, dramatic change to the program that will um, really alter how it functions. And so I think it's, you know, it's 
we've heard nationally that, you know, as Nate mentioned, our uh, members of Congress just aren't hearing about this piece. Um, so if you're concerned, you really need to contact um, your representatives and senators and, and let them know that you have concerns about cutting and capping the program. See, we do we have any more questions? We do have a, a few more minutes if anyone has any more questions. Uh, we do so we get, we got another question here. Uh, do petitions like change.org make any difference? Um, you know, I, I'm not gonna say they don't make any difference. Uh, I think uh, Realistically, like like we've been saying, I think the most important thing uh, really is to contact your representatives and senators um, and let them know about about your that you do not support cap, caps to Medicaid. Um, you know, if, if if someone wants to start a change.org petition, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think it it, it can hurt anything. Um, but uh, realistically, what we need people to do is contact their their representatives and let them know that that this just isn't something that. The people want that um, it would impact the lives of so many individuals in, in um, a variety of ways. Uh, so, you know, I, I would strongly encourage that. Uh, but if, if someone creates a change.org petition, I, I think that's, uh, you know, it can't hurt anything. So, I'm not seeing any other questions, but, uh, you know, we, we have some time here. So, if anyone has uh, anything else, uh, happy to answer any more questions people might have. But I think that may be all the questions we have. Um, so you're more than welcome to. Oh nope, we've got. Okay, that's a that's a great question. Has the media in Utah taken up this issue? Um, the short answer is no. So, um, you know, I think writing op-eds, um, you know, certainly if um, you are somebody who you utilizes Medicaid or your family members that do, um, you know, you can share your story in an op-ed. Um, I know there's lots of great nonprofits here that are working to raise the profile of this issue. We're all working to try and spread the word as much as we can. Um, so, yeah, please, please keep on spreading the word. We, we appreciate everybody's. Um, oh, and also, uh, we on our Facebook, we've been posting a lot about Medicaid and its potential impacts, and we've had links to different news stories and things like that. So please share. Um, our our material on Facebook, so you can follow us on Facebook at, and just look for Disability Law Center. And share those posts, spread the word. Um, so we did get a, another question uh, asking, so in a Medicaid expansion state like Washington, would in-home caregivers and respite programs be cut? Um, you know, in a Medicaid expansion state, uh, those, those services would still, you know, be optional services or, or I guess they would, yeah, they would be optional services. So um, you could see cuts to services like that, uh, regardless of whether or not you're an expansion state or not. Um, I think the, the big takeaway here is that there's, there's a lot of focus on expansion states versus non-expansion -expan states. Um, and there are differences in, in how that will impact them. Um, just in that, uh, you know, there's a there's a larger matching rate for the expansion states for those who, who joined after the the, the ACA, um, and so some of those cuts might be felt uh, a little more in those expansion states. But but the services we would see cut uh, or or could see cut would would not really change um, in expansion versus non-expansion. Um, Oh, and this is actually a really good question too. <laughs> what, is it, what does it mean to be a Medicaid expansion state? Um, so uh, when the Affordable Care Act passed uh, in 2010? Yeah, 2010. <laughs> um, uh, in 2010, uh, they uh, expanded uh, some eligibility for Medicaid to certain individuals living uh, at a certain uh, poverty limit. I'm not actually sure. I think it's... 
think it went up to 138% of the federal poverty, or 150%, but essentially expanded um, the amount of money you could make and still receive Medicaid. Um, and then the way, so it was... Um, and also changed categories of eligibility as well. Yeah, and, and those states that, that did expand uh, received a higher rate. Uh, I believe it was actually 100% of federal matching rate until a certain year. Um, and then after that, I think around 2020, it was going to go to 90% or, or get down to 90% uh, federal matching. Um, and then it was going to, I think, stay at that rate for the foreseeable future. Yeah, and so Utah chose not to do that. So we did not um, expand, but we do really want to emphasize that just because Utah is not a Medicaid expansion state doesn't mean we won't be impacted by this bill and the changes that are proposed to Medicaid because it's really a huge restructuring of Medicaid that will affect us regardless of whether or not we chose to expand. Um, so, I, I, you know, not seeing any more questions right now. Uh, again, if anyone has anything, we, we do have a few more minutes, so if there's anyone who wants to ask anything, feel free. Um, otherwise, again, please uh, call your representatives. Um, is the slide with the number for the representatives? Can we go yeah, back yeah. to that? Um, just so people can see that, that number again. Um, and... Uh, So there's the, the number, again, you can call your senators and representatives. Uh, if you um, don't know who your representative is, uh, there are a lot of ways to look that up. Uh, we'd be happy to provide any resources to anyone who has questions about that. Um, otherwise, you know, just please reach out to your senators and representatives. Uh, keep uh, you know, pushing out those social media posts. Um, yeah, and thank you for joining us this morning. We know it's short notice, um, but we really appreciate everybody for tuning in. And again, that vote is expected for early next week in the House. Um, so it's important to um, contact your representatives as soon as possible and specifically let them know you were concerned about um, the proposal to turn Medicaid into a per capita cap program. That's it. Yeah, well, if you have any more questions, feel free to contact us at Medicaid at disabilitylawcenter.org. We'll also put um, our fact sheets and this webinar on our website, um, so you can access those at any time, and feel free to share them. And you can follow us on Facebook as well for more information. Thank you.